The Secret of Chimneys by Agatha Christie, Chapter 2, A Lady in Distress. So that's that, said Anthony, finishing off his glass and replacing it on the table. What boat are you going on? Granarth Castle. Passage booked in your name, I suppose. So I'd better travel as James McGrath. We've outgrown the passport business, haven't we? No odds either way. You and I are totally unlike, but we'd probably have the same description on one of those blinking things. Height, six feet, hair, brown, eyes blue, nose ordinary, chin ordinary. Not so much of this ordinary stunt. Let me tell you that Castle selected me out of several applicants solely on account of my pleasing appearance and nice manners. Jimmy grinned. I noticed your manners this morning. The devil you did. Anthony rose and paced up and down the room. His brow was slightly wrinkled, and it was some minutes before he spoke. Jimmy, he said at last, Silptich died in Paris. What's the point of sending a manuscript from Paris to London via Africa? Jimmy shook his head helplessly. I don't know. Why not do it up in nice little parcel and send it by post? Sounds a damn slight more sensible, I agree. Of course, continued Anthony. I know that kings and queens and government officials are prevented by etiquette from doing anything in a simple, straightforward fashion. Hence, kings, messengers, and all that. In medieval days, you gave a fellow a signet ring as a sort of open sesame. The king's ring pass, my lord. And usually, it was the other fellow who had stolen it. I always wonder why some bright lad never hit on the expedient of copying the ring, making a dozen or so, and selling them at a hundred ducats piece. They seem at least to have had no initiative in the Middle Ages. Jimmy yawned. My remarks on the Middle Ages don't seem to amuse you. Let's get back to Count Stiltich. From France to England via Africa seems a bit thick even for a diplomatic personage. If he merely wanted to ensure that you should get a thousand pounds, he could have left it in his left at you in his will. Thank God neither you, I, nor I are too proud to accept a legacy. Stiltich must have been barmy. You'd think so, wouldn't you? Anthony frowned and continued his pacing. Have you read the thing at all? He asked suddenly. Read what? The manuscript. Good Lord, no. What do you think I want to read a thing of that kind for? Anthony smiled. I just wondered, that's all. You know, a lot of trouble has been caused by memoirs, indiscreet revelations, that sort of thing. People who have been close as an oyster all their lives seem positively to relish causing trouble when they themselves shall be comfortably dead. It gives them a kind of malicious glee. Jimmy, what sort of a man was Count Stilptich? You met him and talked to him, and you're a pretty good judge of raw human nature. Could you imagine him being a vindictive old devil? Jimmy shook his head. It's difficult to tell, you see. That first night he was distinctly canned, and the next day he was just a high-toned old boy with the most beautiful manners overwhelming me with compliments till I didn't know where to look. And he didn't say anything interesting when he was drunk? Jimmy cast his mind back, wrinkling his brows as he did so. He said he knew where the Kohenur was, he volunteered doubtfully. Oh, well, said Anthony. We all know that. They keep it in the tower, don't they? Behind thick plate glass and iron bars, with a lot of gentlemen in fancy dress standing around to see you don't pinch anything. That's right, agreed Jimmy. Did Stiltich say anything else of the same kind? That he knew which city the Wallace collection was in, for instance? Jimmy shook his head. Hm, said Anthony. He lit another cigarette and once more began pacing up and down the room. You never read the papers, I suppose, you heathen, he threw out presently. Not very often, said McGrath simply. They're not about anything that interests me as a rule. Thank heaven I'm more civilized. There have been several mentions of Hera Slovakia lately, hints of a royalist restoration. Nicholas IV didn't have a son, leave a son, said Jimmy, but I don't suppose for a minute that the Obolovit a Bolovich dynasty is extinct. There are probably shawls of youngins knocking about cousins and second cousins and third cousins once removed, so that there wouldn't be any difficulty finding a king? Not in the least, I should say, replied Jimmy. You know, I don't wonder at their getting tired of Republican institutions. A full-blooded, viral people like that must find it awfully tame to pot at presidents after being used to kings. And talking of kings, that reminds me of something else old Stip still pitched let me out one that night. 
He said he knew the gang that was after him. They were King Victor's people, he said. What? Anthony wheeled round suddenly. A short grin winded on McGrath's face. Just a mite excited, aren't you, gentlemen, Joe, he drawled. Don't be an ass, Jimmy. You've just said something rather important. He went over to the window and stood there looking out. Who is this King Victor anyway? demanded Jimmy. Another Balkan monarch? No, said Anthony so slowly. He isn't that kind of a king. What is he then? There was a pause, and then Anthony spoke. He's a crook, Jimmy, the most notorious jewel thief in the world. A fantastic, daring fellow, not to be daunted by anything. King Victor was the nickname he was known by in Paris. Paris was the headquarters of his gang. They caught him there and put him away for seven years on a minor charge. They couldn't prove the more important things against him. He'll be out soon, or he may be out already. Do you think Count Stiltich had anything to do with putting him away? Was that why the gang went for him? Out of revenge? I don't know, said Anthony. It doesn't seem likely on the face of it. King Victor never stole the crown jewels of Hero Slovakia, as far as I've heard, but the whole thing seems rather subjective, doesn't it? The death of Stiltich, the memoirs and the rumors in the papers, all vague but interesting. And there's a further rumor to the effect that they found old Hero Slovakia. They found oil in Hero Slovakia. I have a feeling in my bones, James, that people are getting ready to be interested in that unimportant little country. What sort of people? He bragged people, yellow-faced financiers, in city offices. What are you driving at with all this? Trying to make an easy job difficult, that's all. You can't pretend there's going to be a di any difficulty in handing over a simple manuscript at a publisher's office. No, said Anthony regretfully. I don't suppose there'll be anything difficult about it, about that. But shall I tell you, James, where I propose to go with my 250 pounds? South America? No, my lad, her Slovakia. I shall stand in with that republic. I think very probably I shall end up as president. Why not announce yourself as the principal of Bolovich and be a king whilst you're about it? No, Jimmy, kings are for life. Presidents only take on the job for four years or so. It would be quite it would quite amuse me to govern a kingdom like Hero Slovakia for four years. The average for kings is even less, I should say, interpolated Jimmy. It will probably be a serious temptation to meet to embezzle your share of the thousand pounds. You won't want it, you know, when you get back weighted down in, with nuggets. I'll invest it for you in Hero Slovakia and oil shares. You know, James, the more I think of it, the more pleased I am with this idea of yours. I should never have thought that Hero Slovakia if you hadn't mentioned it. I shall spend one day in London collecting the booty, and then away by the Balkan Express. You won't get off quite as fast as that. I didn't mention it before, but I've got another little commission for you. Anthony sank into the chair and eyed him severely. I knew all along they were keeping something dark. This is where the catch comes in. Not a bit. It's just something that's got to be done to help a lady. Once and for all, James, I refuse to be mixed up, mixed up in your beastly love affairs. It's not a love affair. I've never seen the woman. I'll tell you the whole story. If I've got to listen to you to more of your long rambling stories, I shall have another. Have to have another drink. His host complied hospitably with his demand, then began the tale. It was when I was up in Uganda. There was a dago there whose life I had saved. If I were you, Jimmy. I should write a short book entitled Lives I Have Saved. This is the second I've heard this evening. Oh, well, I didn't really do anything this time. Just pulled the Dago out of the river. Like all Dagos, he couldn't swim. Wait a minute. Has this story anything to do with the other business? Nothing whatsoever. Though oddly enough, now I remember it, the man was a Hero-Slovakian. We always called him Dutch Pedro, though. Anthony nodded indifferently. Any name's good enough for a Dago, he remarked. Get on with the good work, James. Well, the fellow was sort of grateful about it, hung around like a dog. About six months off later, he died of fever. I was with him. Last thing he, just as he was pegging out, he beckoned me and whispered some excited jargon about a secret. A gold mine, I thought he said. Shoved an oilskin packet into my hand, which he'd always worn around next to his skin. Well, I didn't think much of it at the time. It wasn't until a week afterwards that I opened the packet. Then I was curious, I must confess. I shouldn't have thought that Dutch Pedro 
would have had the sense to know a gold mine when he saw it, but there's no accounting for luck. And at the mere thought of gold, your heart beat pitter pat as always, interrupted Anthony. I was never so disgusted in my life. Gold mine indeed. I dare say it may have been a gold mine to him, the dirty dog. Do you know what it was? A woman's letters. Yes, a woman's letters. And an English woman at that. The skunk had been blackmailing her, and he had the impudence to pass on his dirty bag of tricks to me. I like to see your righteous heat, James, but let me point out that you to you that Dagos will be Dagos. He meant well. You had saved his life. He bequeathed to you a profitable source of raising money. Your high-minded British ideals did not enter his horizon. Well, what the hell was I to do with the things? Burn them? That's what I thought at first. Then it occurred to me that there would be the poor, that poor dame, not knowing they'd been destroyed, and always living in a quake and dread lest that Dago should turn up one again one day. You've more imagination than I give you credit for, Jimmy, observed Anthony, lighting a cigarette. I admit that the case presented more difficulties than were at first apparent. What about just sending them to her by post? Like all women, she'd put no date and no address on most of the letters. There was a kind of address on one, just one, were chimneys. Anthony paused in the act of blowing out his match, and he dropped it with a quick jerk of the wrist as it burnt his finger. Chimneys, he said. That's rather extraordinary. Why? Do you know it? It's one of the stately homes of England, my dear James, a place where kings and queens go for weekends and diplomats foregather and diploma. That's one of the reasons why I'm so glad that you're going to England instead of me. You know all these things, said Jimmy simply. A josser like myself from the backwoods of Canada would be make, making all sorts of bloomers, but someone like you who's been to Eton and Harrow. Only one of them, said Anthony modestly. We'll be able to carry it through. Why didn't I send them to her, you say? Well, it seemed to me dangerous. From what I could make out, she seemed to have a jealous husband. Suppose he opened the letter by mistake. Where would the poor dame be then? Or she might be dead. The letters looked as though they'd been written some time. As I figured it out, the only thing was for someone to take them to England and put them into her own hands. Anthony threw away his cigarette and, coming across to his friend, clapped him affectionately on the back. You're a real knight errant, Jimmy, he said. And the backwoods of Canada should be proud of you. I shan't do the job half as prettily as you would. You'll take it on, then? Of course. McGrath rose, and going across to a drawer, took out a bundle of letters and threw them on the table. Here you are. You better have a look at them. Is it necessary? On the whole, I'd rather not. Well, from what you say about this chimney play, chimney's place, she may have been staying there only. We'd better look through the letters and see if that, there's any clue here, a clue as to where she really hangs out. I suppose you're right. They went through the letters carefully, but without finding what they had hoped to find, Anthony gathered them up again thoughtfully. Poor little devil, he remarked. She was scared stiff. Jimmy nodded. Do you think he'll be able to find her all right? He asked anxiously. I won't leave England till I have. You're very concerned about this unknown lady, James. Jimmy ran his finger thoughtfully over the signature. It's a pretty name, he said apologetically. Virginia Revel. <laughs>